Okay. Okay. Good morning, everyone. I'm Amanda um, from the Urban Ecology Center here to talk to you today um, about brood parasitism with uh, Nest and Show. But first, as always, thank you for subscribing to Backyard Naturalist. If you're not a subscriber, you can become one. Um, we have seasonal and annual subscriptions available and members to the Urban Ecology Center get 20% off. And your subscription includes weekly lectures, a monthly field trip like the one that you'll be going on tomorrow with Bill Keen, um, as well as a subscriber appreciation party. I also want to plug next week is going to kick off our Brucey Birding Festival. Um, we're going to start with a special backyard naturalist from Tim um, to celebrate World Migratory Bird Day. And then that following Saturday, May 13th, we'll uh, get a little competitive with the Green Birding Challenge. So grab a few teammates and bike, walk, or sit your way to glory. Um, see as many species as you can before returning for some lunch um, and some more birdie fun. And then on Sunday, we'll keep the momentum of green birding going and celebrate moms everywhere. So just take a few minutes um, to bird without fossil fuels and share your list with us um, in our virtual backyard birding blitz. Monday, James and Brittany are going to lead a day-long trip to Horicon Marsh, which is full, um, but you can join us that evening um, to hear from Madison Audubon and their efforts to reduce bird collisions in a virtual lecture. We'll have hummingbird banding um, at the Milwaukee County Zoo um, and get a special tour of their aviary and then hear in another virtual lecture from the Western Great Lakes Bird and Bat Observatory on their um, efforts to install modus towers um, around the Western Great Lakes. On Wednesday, you can join Tim um, on the Big Green Birding Bike Ride um, and cruise around the city in search of birds on a day-long adventure or join us, join us um, at Riverside Park for a bird art night. Thursday, we'll head to Retzer Nature Center um, for some birding in the morning, and then you can head home for a quick nap before joining us for a beer at Gathering Place Brewery, uh, Brewing Company in River West, for a special in-person lecture from Chris Yonke um, on the Connecticut Warbler and his research and travels. And then Friday, we'll be back with Backyard Naturalists to wrap up things with a species spotlight from the International Crane Foundation, um, and then followed by an exclusive access event um, at Washington Park, we'll be having our uh, Take It All um, event where you can come and look through books that were graciously donated from the libraries of Noel Cutright and um, Birdwashing Magazine. Um, whereas we're trying to make room for construction and renovation, we can't keep everything. So come and take a look and take what you want, pay what you can. All right, but back to our featured program. Today we're talking about brood parasitism. Parasitism is generally a symbiotic relationship in which one organism benefits and the other is harmed. Parasites are different from predators because they do not kill their hosts. And when we typically think of parasites, we think of organisms that live exclusively on or in their hosts, like ticks or tapeworms. But other forms of parasitism exist, like brood parasitism. With brood parasitism, our parasite is an animal that does not raise their, its own offspring, but rather forces another animal to do so. Um, this is really only observed in animals that lay eggs and commonly invest parental care in their offspring. Um, thus, it's really only been observed in ray and fish, birds, and colonial insects. Today, we'll mostly focus on birds because it is most common um, in birds, but there are a few situations um, like with raven fish and colonial insects that um, present quite interesting case studies. One is the cuckoo catfish. Um, it is a brood parasite of um, mouth breeding cichlids. Um, this species is only present in a single lake in the Great Rift Valley lake system in Africa. Um, and when the cichlids spawn, 
the scent um, produced from their spawning excites the cuckoo fat catfish into spawning as well. Um, as eggs are laid, the catfish slips in and eats the eggs of the cichlid before the mother can collect them, and while doing so, also releases and fertilizes their own eggs, leaving the cichlid to collect them. They scoop them up in their mouth, um, and then they're carrying around these catfish eggs for a while. Catfish will hatch a few days earlier, um, and any cichlid eggs that are present, um, these young catfish will eat. Um, and so now the cichlid just has a mouthful of little baby catfish. Uh, cuckoo bees and cuckoo wasps lay their eggs in nest cells of other bees. They are not typically referred to as brood parasites, but rather kleptoparasites. Um, this is because they are never directly fed by an adult host, but rather these the parasite lays their eggs in the nest and the young will take food that are gathered from the host, um, meaning they're they're stealing from the host, so it's more a form of kleptoparasitism than brood parasitism, uh, technically, but true insect brood parasitism is fairly rare, um, and they really only will use um, either nest usurpation or chemical mimicry. So like this cuckoo bumblebee will kill and replace the existing queen of a colony, um, of its host species, and then use the host workers to feed its brood. Cuckoo paper wasps have completely lost their ability to build its own their own nest, and so they rely on another species of paper wasp to raise its brood in the same way. So similar to the cuckoo bumblebee, they'll usurp the nest and uh, force the workers to, to care for their brood. There are a couple different butterflies that are really interesting, like this mountain uh, blue. They will lay eggs and their larvae release chemicals that confuse the hosts. Um, their hosts are ants. These ants believe um, the butterfly larvae are actually ant larvae based on the, the chemical um, scent that the larvae are releasing, and they'll bring them back to their nests and feed them from there. In birds, um, we'll, we'll get into birds. I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, but essentially, using brood parasitism frees up the parasite of parental obligation. Um, in species where the young is going to defend, are going to depend on their parents for food and protection, um, employing brood parasitism allows the parasite bird to skip out on this effort. Um, this in turn increases their chance of successfully rearing multiple offspring each year um, because with birds especially you're not putting all all of your your eggs in in a single nest um, in birds brood parasitism can either be intraspecific where where birds of the same species will lay eggs in each other's nests um, or interspecific where one species, will lay eggs in another species' nest. Species that lay eggs in other nests uh, of other individuals in the same species include ducks, cranes, and grouse uh, most commonly, um, but it's been observed in, in many other species. At least 234 species have been observed participating in interspecific brood parasitism, uh, but it's most common in colonial species that have young that are precocial or are born pretty much ready to go, able to kind of care for themselves for the most part. Um, but it's really hard to observe interspecific brood parasitism because the young are going to look no different. Um, the young that hatch as well as the eggs are going to look no different from the host. Um, so this form of parasitism parasitism may be um, a lot more common than we think. Much rarer is interspecific brood parasitism, where birds of one species will lay eggs in nests of other species. Um, this is common in cuckoos. If you if you didn't notice with our, our fish and insect examples, all those were named after cuckoos. 
Um, not all cuckoos uh, display brood parasitism, but they're probably one of the more famous examples. Um, but it's also common in cowbirds and honey guides, and it has been observed in a single species of duck, this, this black-headed duck, which is an interesting case and we'll, we'll talk about later. Birds, as we know, are extremely are extremely diverse group, but roughly only 100 species are obligate interspecific brood parasites, parasites, meaning they no longer have the ability to make their own nest, they have to lay their eggs in another species nest. Um, so this accounts for about 1% of all birds, but collectively they parasitize over 950 species, which is about 10% of all species. How this works is the parasite birds are going to seek out a host nest to lay their eggs in. They do this in multiple ways. Um, they might do it through sort of surveillance where they um, watch their host species, see where their nest is, watch when they come and go. Um, some will use distraction where they kind of egg on the host bird. Um, the male of the parasite species will lure them away from the nest so the female can lay her eggs. There wasn't a good example. The red-winged blackbird is not. Our, the red-winged blackbird is a, a victim of this, but our um, heron and various um, raptor species are not brood parasites, but this was the best example I could find of someone chasing other birds. Uh, but parasites can also use mimicry. So like this, this cuckoo um, is very similar in, in pattern and coloration to um, the sparrow hawk. Once they surveil nest and, and find a good nest to lay in, parasite birds will sometimes remove an egg when they lay one. Um, because some birds have the ability to recognize um, there are more or fewer eggs. Others will destroy the host's egg, um, pecking them to crack them. Others lay eggs in a manner that will damage the eggs. Um, there's one species that will essentially just like put its butt up in the air so the egg just like ejects out and falls down and will land on other eggs and crack them. Parasite eggs almost always hatch like two to four days earlier, giving them a bit of a head start, which also plays into this, this surveillance. Um, they're timing, they're timing that perfectly so that their young will hatch first. Because if the parent isn't working to sabotage the host's nest, their young will do it. Um, some species, like the cuckoo, instinctively will push other eggs or other nestlings out of the nest, um, so they are the sole focus of the host. Um, they have this, this egg-tossing behavior that is instinctual. It starts as soon as they are, are hatched, um, where they use essentially the hollow of their back to throw eggs and or their nestmates. Um, Others will outright kill their siblings, um, pecking them to death or destroying their eggs. For example, the species is born with like a specialized beak part um, that they only have at birth. Um, that's very sharp and they instinctively just bite everything um, in an effort to destroy eggs and kill other nest mates. If the parasite doesn't eliminate its nestmate outright, um, it will outcompete them. The parasite is typically larger, louder, and more annoying, which overwhelms the host, um, which will just feed it continuously just to shut it up. Uh, this leaves its nestmates malnourished um, if they don't die, um, but you can see. Uh, the parasite bird is typically larger. Its its uh, mouth is more appealing, and it's just annoying. 
And once it's by itself, the baby will grow bigger and bigger until the host is feeding a baby that is up to four times the size it is. But how do hosts respond either to, to prevent this entirely or to, to interfere? There's several different mechanisms that a host can use, um, including the scent, immaculation, meaning like the, the pattern of the egg, the speckledness, size, color, shape, um, the contrast between the egg and the nest, as well as the parasite host ratio. So um, how many how many eggs are in the nest, essentially. Some, the, some birds are pretty good at recognizing that something isn't right and will eject the egg or abandon the nest, um, or they'll cover it with other nesting material um, and essentially start over. Um, robins are pretty good at detecting cowbird eggs. Cowbirds are interesting because they're the only um, brood parasite in North America, and they are probably the least picky when it comes to, to host species. It has been found that specifically the brown-headed cowbird has at least 220 host species, all the way from hummingbirds to raptors, um, and they'll lay up to 36 eggs in a season. Birds like blue-gray gnatcatchers, yellow warblers, brown thrashers, gray catbirds, um, American red starts, how, uh, house finches, and robins are all um, known for employing different methods, either intentionally or unintentionally, to prevent parasitism from the brown-headed cowbird. Um, like, for example, the house finch feed their young a vegetarian diet, which just isn't suitable for, for cowbirds. Um, but most other species um, in this grouping that I just listed, notice the egg and will reject it, either by manually ejecting it or abandoning their nest entirely. Um, this can have consequences, though. Um, some birds, particularly cowbirds, will exhibit mafia behavior and retaliate um, if they know the egg is not being cared for or has been rejected either destroying nests of their hosts um, when their egg is removed or killing um, any offspring of the host bird. For some, this is, it's really hard to prevent parasitism because many birds have started to evolve to lay eggs that are very, very similar to their hosts. Cowbirds, not very good at that, um, but most par brood parasites are specialists, uh, meaning they specialize in a single host or small group of hosts. Only cowbirds are, are generalist species that will lay wherever. The common cuckoo um, is a super interesting case because they seem to be generalists. Um, on the as a whole, the group parasites parasitizes over a hundred host species, but individual birds specialize in a single host. So individual maternal lines um, will only lay in certain, certain host nests. Um, and it appears that genes that regulate egg coloration um, are exclusively passed along this maternal line, which allow females to lay eggs that mimic um, eggs in the nests of the species that they specialize in. But again, this is um, just single individuals that specialize in, in these hosts. Um, and so the common cuckoo as a whole has a very wide range of, of egg color, shape, size, um, pattern, but certain maternal lines will specialize in, in more individual hosts. Another interesting way that uh, brood parasites have evolved um, is in a way that mimics the host nestlings. Um, some species have evolved similar coloration um, and even even heat signature patterns um, on the insides of their mouth that um, attract the 
the parent to feed it. Um, so these are examples of indigo birds and why does, um, and you can see that the pattern itself is very similar, but also the heat signature it gives off is very similar to its host. They'll also match coloration, plumage, as well as behavior of the host um, nestlings. So you can see some examples of, of coloration. Um, they'll match like the, the plumage patterns as they get older and then behavior, even though this bird is clearly very different. Um, Behavior-wise, it confuses the host bird. Um, but some hosts are evolving alongside, all hosts are evolving alongside their parasite. Um, but a super interesting case is the superb fairy wren. Um, they can be parasitized by cuckoos, but they're not very good at, at this egg recognition that some other birds are good at, um, or even recognition of the nestlings once they hatch. But what they do is they can teach their eggs a sort of password. While the mother incubates, she'll sing a song, um, which when the eggs hatch, their the nestlings will incorporate this little little tiny tune or even just a single note into their begging calls. The cuckoo is unable to mimic the song and the fairy wren will recognize this. She is small enough that she can't really do anything once they're hatched, but then she'll abandon the nest and start over. So like I said, all, um, all parasites are evolving alongside their, their hosts. Um, this is something we call the Red Queen hypothesis um, from, from Alice in Wonderland. It essentially says that it takes all the running you can do to keep in the same place. So hosts have to continuously be evolving mechanisms that deter parasites, and parasites are continuously evolving mechanisms that make it easier for them to go undetected. Um, and so it's like this evolutionary arms race that they're participating in. But not all um, brood parasites are are jerks, like like Tori would say. Um, some, like the black headed duck, uh, are are obligate interspecific brood parasites. But the adults or the chicks don't detract from from the parent or really do anything. Um, in an effort to to kill or stunt the growth of the host um, eggs. Black-headed ducks are the only member of the, the group that includes ducks and geese and swans that are brood parasites, interspecific brood, par brood parasites. Um, these ducks are found in South America and are very closely related to stiff-tailed ducks, um, like the ruddy duck. And they will um, parasitize several different hosts, um, most commonly coots, um, but they have been reported to use other, other waterfowl, rail, um, gull, and even raptor nests. But um, unlike the brood parasites we've already talked about, neither the chick nor adults will destroy the eggs or kill the chicks. Um, all the host is really needed for is incubation because once they hatch, the duckling will just kind of get up and leave a few hours after. Um, they don't need parental care um, beyond incubation. Then we have cases like the, um, the great spotted cuckoo. These birds will lay their eggs um, in the nests of, of multiple different species, but um, very commonly carrion crows, and researchers have found that crow chick survival rates in a nest that is shared by a cuckoo are higher than ones that are not parasitized. Um, and what they have found is that the cuckoo nestling will give off a scent um, when threatened that deters, deters predators. Um, and so as we know, crows and ravens are very smart. They recognize 
um, that their nest has been parasitized, but in this case, it's better for them. So they don't they don't do anything about it um, because having a parasitized nest increases the chances of um, their own offspring survival rate. Um, but ultimately, this is a super unique style of parenting. Like I said, it's only about 100 species, which is about 1% of all bird diversity. Um, so why why does it exist if it's so rare? Um, and like we said, it, it might be because it takes the burden of parenting off of the parasite bird, um, which might make them more successful. They can lay more eggs. Um, they're not, they're pu not putting all their eggs in one basket. Um, as the saying goes, they are increasing the chances that more of their offspring will survive by spreading, spreading this out. Um, but are, are they really more successful? This takes a lot of energy to do, um, energy that you could spend parenting. Um, so we'll end with a video, which means I have to stop the recording. <laughs>